The first one was I got to go to Nebraska. Very exciting. Um, there's no Nebraska flag to put up. I'm sorry if you're from Nebraska. Um, I got to go to Nebraska. The reason being, my cousin was getting married, and I, I got to officiate the wedding, which was really special. Really special. Um, it, was a, it was a wonderful wedding, uh, as wonderful as you can get in Omaha. Um, and it was a wonderful little facility. It was a small wedding, but the family was there. All the people that needed to be there were there. It, it, was, it was a great time. It, it wasn't the first wedding that I've officiated, but it was definitely the most unique. Um, and actually not because of Nebraska, but uh, for some other reasons. You see, my uh, cousin uh, looks a lot like me. Um, actually, she's blonde, so even more like me than I do. And uh, my now cousin-in-law, uh, her new husband uh, is Karen, which means he's from uh, at least the ethnicity from what's now Myanmar, and uh, he actually grew up in Thailand. Um, and uh, then after that, he moved to Arizona and ended up at Union College, and they met at summer camp, uh, and they have, a, they have a wonderful story. Uh, they've been together about five years. He's a nurse, and she's a, an elementary teacher there in Omaha, and so... Uh, it's a wonderful couple, and I'm not here to brag about my extended family, but I, I am here to say that it was a, a definitely a unique wedding, to say the least. Um, all weddings are, are fun and special to see that, that coming together of people, the coming together, the joining of the two families. Uh, it's special, but I think often you take it for granted when both families are pretty similar. Um, these families probably couldn't have been more different. Um, as I was up there speaking, it was a pretty short wedding because uh, only half the people understood the word that I was saying uh, in English. And uh, so that was, that was fun. But uh, when they kissed, everybody cheered. So I guess that one, everybody understood that language. Um, but no, it was very special. But it was, it was interesting to see these Karen people joining into a family with people from, um, well, her family's mostly from Texas. Uh, very different. And so I couldn't help but as we were celebrating, as we were having this wonderful time, as we were celebrating the coming together of families, the joining of families, the, the oneness, the union that was happening, not just between these two individuals, but also between these families, it, it, it was just such a stark, beautiful reality to realize just how different these people were. And yet we were still coming together. We were still being bound together by love. So that was... That was the first thing I got to experience. That was a lot of fun. That was a good, a good thing and a, a good chance to, to see people coming together. Uh, the second thing that I got to do this week uh, was, was very different, but it was still uh, a coming together of people, a joining together of people. Um, I, I got to go to a baseball game, which was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It was a professional baseball game. Uh, if you guys are paying attention to sports at all, you know that we're leading up to a World Series right now, so it's, it's the playoffs, it's exciting. I've never been to a playoff game for anything before. It was fun. It was a good time. And if you've ever been to a professional sports game or really any sporting event uh, at all, for that matter, you know that uh, it gets pretty exciting when you're cheering for the team you support, the team you want to win. Um, you rally against the, the enemy, the team on the other side, and especially if you're a home team, which I went to go see the, the home team for this, the home game for this team, it's mostly, the vast majority, are for the team that you're on. 
but there's always a couple you can see why the colors they're wearing that uh, they don't really belong there and you can you know who you're cheering against right and so it was interesting because at the wedding we're coming together and uh, it's for a common purpose it's to celebrate it's to support but here at this event this game it was a very different kind of coming together we were coming together against somebody against someone but it was still coming together uh, I'm happy to say that the, the team I was supporting that they won that game it was worth it worth the price of admission uh, but as we were cheering and you're getting wrapped up in all the, the jubilations and people are waving towels and, and everything um, I couldn't help but notice some of the people in the wrong colored jackets walking down the stairs um, looking kind of dejected, wanting to have teleportation be invented so that they could just get out of there, not have to walk past all the happy fans of, of their enemy, the people on the other side. And I couldn't help but stop and think, man, I spent money on these tickets and I got to go with my family and it was really special, but man, how miserable would that be if this thing I had looked forward to, the team I supported had lost? That would have been pretty depressing. And, and I couldn't help but think, what is it about this, this game, these sports, that make me look at those people differently? That makes me somehow see them as the enemy? You know, it's funny because the, the wedding, yes, it was a different kind of coming together. But like I said, those two families couldn't have been any more different. They couldn't have been any different in terms of not only language, but culture, background. Um, many of his family were Adventists, but a completely different kind of Adventist from... Uh, most of my family and yet here in Southern California I was at a game with people probably the vast majority are from Southern California we're from the same place and yet somehow I saw them as different as an enemy as somebody on the other side and I couldn't help but stop and just reflect on that there's actually a, a, a third thing that I got to uh, I shouldn't say got to, I had to experience this past week. Um, it's something you probably have experienced as well. Uh, it's actually been the last couple weeks probably, but uh, I've been getting uh, texts, I've been getting emails, uh, every TV screen I look at, um, I've almost forgotten what uh, the Coca-Cola brand looks like because I don't see commercials anymore. All I see are political ads for different politicians. And you know, what's crazy is not only are they in your face trying to show you who you should vote for, to say yes or no on a different prop or on this number, on that number, they're also trying to make the other side look as evil as possible, right? And sometimes I don't even know which side the ad is for because the other side must clearly be so evil and inhuman, uh, I, I don't know that I would recognize them if they tried to explain themselves. It's a time of year, a, a culture that we're in right now, where we are being constantly divided. And you know, it's funny because sports is one thing. It's easy for us to see ourselves as, I'm, I'm on this team or I support this team. I'm on this side, you're on that side. But at the end of the day, hopefully we can all remember how truly insignificant that is in the grand scheme of things, in the grand scheme of life, right? But politics, you're starting to get a little bit more into that, oh, this kind of actually matters. No. And it's easier to get into the, well, I'm on this team, and you're on that team, and yeah, you're wearing the wrong colors. I'm in red, and you're in blue. In the stadium, you're standing out because you don't fit with what I believe. And it's easy because all of a sudden, you're getting into these situations where not only are you just supporting a team when it comes to politics, you're actually saying, I can't even associate with somebody who supports the other side. Something that could make you actually refuse to speak or be associated with a member of your own family, a loved one, a friend. Politics is just one example of something that's just that little bit more significant, that makes it easier to, to cut somebody off, to increase the distance between you and them. Now again, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you shouldn't stand up for what you believe in. Uh, please do that. But what I'm focusing on this morning and what we're focusing on here as we celebrate 
our International Sabbath, our theme is One Body, One Spirit, One Hope. I want to focus on just that, the distance between us. What is it that's pushing us apart, and what is it that's bringing us together? You see, as humans, it's really easy for us to take up sides, to make up teams. We love to make it about us versus them in any chance that we can. Why is that? Well, it's a couple of different reasons. One is I think we love to be right. We love to be right. We love to prove others wrong. We love to prove others wrong and prove that we're right so much that we would, could care less often about who's on the other side of the line because they're on the other side. And so what if they're against you, they're on the wrong side? Who cares if they have a story and a history, if they have value? Who cares if the greatest commandment is to love one another? They're on the wrong side, and I'm on a mission to prove I'm right. We as humans make it so easy for ourselves to get wrapped up in this. And no human is exempt from it. We all fall short of this commandment to love, and we fall under instead our own commandment to always be right, to always be correct, to always be on the right side. There's only one person in history that I can think of that truly understood what mattered above all else, that somehow kept things in perspective, always. There's a man named Jesus, the Son of God. He was perfect and holy, righteous, sinless, blameless. And yet he spent time befriending people who stood against cleanliness and righteousness and sinlessness. When the religious leaders, the people who should have been on his side of the line, who were on his team, when they drew a line in the sand and picked up stones to throw at the woman on the other side of the line, Jesus stood on the other side with the woman. That woman had been caught in sin. That woman, while we don't know her story really other than what the Bible tells us, Jesus should have been on the other side probably if you had been guessing from a human standpoint. And yet he stood with the woman caught in sin, and he defended her. He didn't leave her alone. Jesus hung out with sinners. He ate with tax collectors. He spent his time with prostitutes and fishermen and the uneducated. And yet he still called them to live a better way. And he didn't only align himself with one side. You have to remember he spent a night talking to Nicodemus. He spent time crying and weeping over Jerusalem, wanting them to be more open to the idea of loving one another, of following him, of a relationship with God. He called everyone to live a better way indiscriminately. Jesus said to come and follow him, to be a part of his body of believers, his church. He said, I'm calling you to a greater purpose greater than the teams that you create for yourself. Maybe when you're younger, it starts with supporting a sports team, but then as you get older, maybe it's politics, and maybe it's what country you support, and maybe it's a certain policy, and maybe it's how church should be done, and maybe it's what kind of music you support, and then pretty soon before you know it, you're so closed off that nobody else is on your team, and it's just you, and there's so much distance between you and making a connection with anyone else that you can barely would ever remember what it means to love one another. Jesus said, if you come join me, if you come join this body, this church, you don't have to worry because he will be with you. Jesus says that we don't have to be afraid because he is with us. And that's so wonderful for us to remember. That's so wonderful for us if all the teams that we put ourselves in, on all the sides that we align ourselves with, the identities that we have, the things that we're proud of, the patriotism, and all the things that go with it. Good things. It's good to know that God's on your side, right? It's good to know that God's on your side. But does that mean that God isn't on the other side? What about that uncle that you, you can't stand to have dinner with anymore? that you're tempted to skip Thanksgiving dinner just so you don't have to listen to him talk. 
It's not even that you're going to engage with him in conversation. You just know no matter what happens, he's going to start talking. Is God with you or is God with him? What about that child who you, you think has become so rebellious, has pushed back against everything you think you taught them, the, the, the way you raised them to be in the church, what you wanted them to believe, who you wanted them to be, what you wanted them to partake in, who you wanted themselves to associate themselves with? What about that kid? Is Jesus with them or is he with you? Or could it be both? It's in Scripture. The scripture for today that I wanted to focus on is Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 to 29. Paul is writing to the church of Galatia, and he's saying some things about how the church needs to be treating one another, about the teams that they have for each other. You know, in Galatians 5, a couple chapters later, he says something, but we're going to come back to chapter 3. He says something in Galatians 5, Verse 6, he says, you know, circumcision and uncircumcision, it may be important, but it's not what truly matters. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. He's trying to talk about the distance between us. The teams matter. They may have their place. What you believe in matters. But what about that distance between you? He says this earlier in chapter 3, Galatians Chapter 3, verses 27 to 29. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Those of you that have joined this body, this church, this spirit, this hope, you have put on Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, his heirs according to the promise. That last verse, sometimes we skip over that because we just say, oh, okay, there's no sides. But Jesus says, what Paul says, is that there is still a side. You're still a part of the offspring of Abraham. And what does that mean? You're a child of God. There's still one team that matters more than anything else. The team of being a part of this body, of this faith, of being a child of God. When we come to these questions of uh, whose side Jesus is really on, when it comes to sports, I think God was with the, the fans who were on the other side of me. I believe that. When it comes to politics, it may be a little bit more difficult, but I believe, believe God is on the other side of me. When it comes to countries, I believe God is with the U.S., but I believe he's working in other countries as well. I believe that God's working in the Middle East. I don't understand exactly how, but I know he's working. When it comes to the question of whose side is Jesus really on, I propose this morning that Jesus was less concerned with the teams that we humans set up for ourselves, and he was more concerned with the distance between us with getting us all on his side, on his team. There's a, a children's song that I love. Maybe you know it as well. It talks about how Jesus loves the little children. How does it go? Jesus loves the little children. All are precious in his sight, right? It says it doesn't matter what their skin color is. It doesn't matter who they are, where they're from, what their parents are, what their yearly income of their financial situation with their parents is, whether they're in a, a, a job with, uh, or in a family with two working parents or one that works in tech in Irvine and that's all you need. It doesn't matter. All are precious to Jesus. All are precious in his sight. And what I'm here to say to you this morning is not only are we here to celebrate where you're from, what your history is, what your ethnicity is, what church or country you come from, we're here to celebrate that, yes. But I'm here to say that you are still a child of God. That preciousness that Jesus has for you, it doesn't go away once you hit the age of double digits of 10. It doesn't go away once you're 18 or 21. It doesn't go away once you're married and have kids of your own. That preciousness 
that Jesus treats you as his child, it never leaves. It never leaves. So the question this morning, as we celebrate the beauty of our diversity, of our oneness here in this church, in this family, I ask you, what do you see as your team? What's the most important team? What's the most important goal in your life? Is it who wins in about a month? Is it who wins the World Series? Hopefully not. Is it something else? Is it something other than Jesus' ultimate victory that he already has in hand? Are you on the side that has already won, or are you on something else? And the reminder, if you choose to be on the side of Jesus, on the team of God, the side that has already won the battle, if you choose to be on that side, you need to remember that those people on the other side of the lines that you may have drawn in the sand, they may be on your team as well. And even if they're not on your team, even if it doesn't feel like it, that's still a child that is precious in God's sight. So no matter whether we're from Bangladesh or Zambia, Croatia, Romania, wherever we're from, God calls us to love one another, to be mindful of the distance between us, to draw closer to one another, and to truly have the goal and the hope to be one body one body of Christ's church. Let's do that here at Laguna Niguel. Amen. Amen.